This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of illegal drugs, violence, or criminal activity in any way. Pablo Escobar is still considered the most successful criminal in the history of the world, having amassed a fortune of over $30 billion in just two short decades. So how did he do it? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. Today we are talking about the life and times of Pablo Escobar. We're going to go back, we're going to talk about his childhood and how he got into the cartel business. We're going to talk about cocaine production and how that works. We're going to talk about the cocaine trafficking and specifically how Pablo Escobar was able to smuggle so much cocaine into the United States. We're going to talk about the increase in strife between the cartel and the government, as well as rival cartels and the violence that exploded in Colombia during the 70s and the 80s. We're going to talk about Pablo Escobar's last days, and then we're going to look at where are they now. Several of the family members that were involved in the Medellin cartel are still alive to this day. So we'll end with a little update as to those individuals. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And remember that Lawyer Up is available on all major podcast outlets. And I'll do my typical disclaimer. This video is in no way an endorsement of the use of hard drugs. This is for infotainment purposes only. Don't use hard drugs. And with that disclaimer, Let's talk about Pablo Escobar. So Pablo Escobar was also known as Don Pablo, El Padrino, the godfather, and El Patron, the boss. He was born in 1949 in Colombia, South America, and he grew up in a town called Medellin. Pablo was one of seven children. His father was a farmer, his mother was an elementary school teacher, and stories differ on how Pablo originally got into organized crime. Actually, stories differ on about everything you're going to hear in this video. Everybody's got a book or they did an interview and they have a different perspective about how this whole thing went down. So if you hear something that's different than what you heard in this video, it's not a shocker. What I've tried to do is find where these stories overlap and where we can have some consistency with the accounts and that's what I'm reporting in this video. Even the city of Medellin, I've heard it pronounced four different ways, and I'm going with the traditional Spanish version that we say in the United States, but the people who actually live there, they pronounce it Medellin. So conflict abounds with this particular story. So what we know from the beginning was that Pablo Escobar stole gravestones as a kid. What he would do was he would steal the gravestones, he would sand down the letters and the numbers, and then he would resell them to smugglers. When he got a little older, he started making counterfeit high school diplomas for teenagers in Medellin. Then he started selling contraband cigarettes, making fake lottery tickets, and stealing cars. Meanwhile, and make a mental note of this, over in the United States, the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970, which made the selling, smuggling, and trafficking of cocaine a Class A felony, punishable by prison of from 10 years to life. Now, this was going to become a very big deal in Escobar's life in a few short years. So don't forget about the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. But back to Colombia. Now, in the early 1970s, Escobar broke bad for good when he made $100,000, and that's U.S. dollars, for a kidnapping of an executive from Medellin, and he held him for ransom. Now, that stunt got the attention of Alvaro Prieto, who was a major contraband smuggler in and around Medellin at that time. And that's where Escobar learned the trade, the trade of cocaine production and trafficking. And in 20 short years, he amassed a $30 billion empire. It would be $60 billion in 2021 dollars. And he did it selling cocaine all over the world, but mainly in the United States. 
So let's talk for a moment about cocaine, where it comes from and how it's made. So when we're talking about cocaine production, you start with the coca plant. It's three to four feet tall and it has small green leaves that look like green tea leaves. Uh, these plants are indigenous to the mountains and jungle areas of Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia in South America. And the cocaine is actually extracted from the leaves themselves. Now, to transform these leaves into actual cocaine is a fairly involved process. And if you want details about how the various types of cocaine are made, you can check out my other video called The History of Cocaine. It's available on this channel. So today in this video, you're going to get a crash course on how to make cocaine hydrochloride. And that's the powder cocaine uh, that Escobar sold. And there's various ways to make it, but here is the most common way and what was used in South America at the time. It's a three-phase process, and the first phase is the extraction phase. And this is generally done by the farmers in the mountains that have large batches of these uh, coca plants and these coca leaves. So the first step is, of course, to harvest the leaves, and you pick them off the plant it doesn't hurt the plant. Uh, they regenerate these leaves, and you can actually harvest uh, leaves uh, up to six times per year. Then you spread the leaves out and you let them dry. Once they're dry, you mince them or you chop them up. Once they're minced, then you sprinkle the leaves with powdered cement. Yeah, no joke, powdered cement, sulfuric acid, and phosphorus. Then you toss the leaves kind of like a salad to make sure they get an even coating all around. Then you put these coated leaves into a 55 gallon drum or drums, which are then filled with diesel fuel or you can use kerosene, uh, where the leaves sit for a few hours as the cocaine is extracted from the coca leaves. Then we move to phase two and that's called the base phase. What you do there is you drain the liquid out of the drums. Now the leaves will stay in the 55 gallon drums and they can be discarded because you're basically done with them at this point. So what drains out is a light green liquid. It's a mixture of the diesel fuel and the extracted cocaine. Now you add ammonia, which turns this green mixture into a milky white mixture as the diesel fuel bonds with the ammonia and separates from the cocaine. Then you pour that mixture through a filter. Usually they use a cloth uh, and the diesel and the ammonia, they pour through and what remains on the cloth or the filter, that is the cocaine paste. Now once that paste is dried, that is the cocaine base or free base cocaine. The farmers in South America could call it pasta base. It's a pearly white or an off color white. And that's as far as the farmers take it. They usually will sell the pasta base or the free base cocaine to cartels or other intermediaries for further processing. And that further processing is phase three, the hydrochloride phase. And this is usually done in a cartel cocaine lab. It can be done on a small scale in just an everyday kitchen, but they usually have formal labs where they process mass quantities. So what you do is you take the cocaine base and you put it in an acetone water bath and you bring it to a boil. Then you mix in hydrochloric acid, which causes the crystallization and converts the cocaine base into cocaine hydrochloride. So from there, you drain the liquids and you press the cocaine hydrochloride to squeeze out all of the excess solvents. And then you put that mixture into brick forms uh, that will render a product of about a kilogram in weight. And then you let that dry. The resulting product is a fairly pure cocaine hydrochloride or that bright white powdery cocaine that we're familiar with here in the US. And pure cocaine is expensive. So dealers often step on it or they cut it with some inexpensive additive. They use baking soda or caffeine or ephedrine. They'll use about anything that's white and remotely powdery. And so basically that's how Escobar produced the powder cocaine that he sold as the leader of the Medellin cartel. Now, most of what we know about Pablo Escobar comes directly from his family, whether it be by book or by interview. Now, some of it comes from a couple of his lovers. Most of the specific financial information comes from his brother, Roberto Escobar, who was the bookkeeper for the cartel and who wrote the book, The Accountant's Story, Inside the Violent World of the Medellin Cartel. 
And from Roberto, we really gain a understanding of the economics of cocaine in the 70s and the 80s, and just how exactly Pablo Escobar was able to make $30 billion in just two decades. And his short answer was, it was supply and demand. So let's look at that in a little more detail. Let's talk about the supply side, right? So 75% of the world's cocaine comes from Colombia. And in their heyday, 80% of the cocaine that was coming into the United States was controlled, at least in part, by the Medellin cartel. So they had a stranglehold on the supply. And in an unregulated black market, that is a very good thing for your business. Now let's talk about the demand in the United States. Now, Cocaine was popular at the turn of the 20th century until about 1914 when it was criminalized due to its high potential for addiction and overdose. Then cocaine was basically dormant for about 60 years in the United States. And that was until the hippies came along. And no, hippies weren't doing cocaine. They were doing their marijuana and their psychedelics. But what they did was they normalized drug experimentation and recreational drug use in the United States. So it was the next generation that came along and adopted cocaine as its drug of choice, fueling the sex, drugs, and rock and roll mantra of the 70s and the 80s. So you have Pablo Escobar with a stranglehold on the cocaine supply and an entire generation of Americans wanting a piece of it. That is the recipe to make a billionaire. So let's dive in a little deeper and look specifically at the numbers and quantities that were being transferred. Now, I'm going to use today's values, $2021, and we're going to use round approximate numbers. Cocaine values, they vary drastically around the globe. But these are some average 2021 numbers in the United States. But before we go there, let's go back to Colombia. So the cocaine paste that the farmers sell, that's going for about $1,000 a kilo. And a kilo of the powder cocaine, that sells for about $2,000 in Colombia. But if you smuggle that same kilo of powder cocaine to the United States, it goes from anywhere between $25,000 and $30,000 a kilo. And it's moved up towards $35,000 in New York City. And if you're willing to bust it up and sell it by the gram on the streets, you can make a lot more money. Now, let's hit a couple terms. So kilo is short for kilogram or kilogram, right? And kilo means a thousand. Gram means gram. So a kilo of cocaine is a thousand grams of cocaine. So if cocaine is selling on an average for $100 a gram on the streets in the United States, a divided up kilo would be a thousand grams of coke at $100 a gram or $100,000. So as a business model, if you can take something worth $2,000 in place A, Colombia, and you can move it to place B, the United States, where it's worth 10 times its original value, you are going to do that, right? You're going to do that as many times as you can. And like I said, if you bust it up, you can turn $2,000 worth of powder cocaine in Colombia into $100,000 in the United States. Like I said, that is the recipe for creating an empire and billionaires. Now today's values are about twice what they were when Pablo Escobar was moving cocaine. But you can see that with these types of numbers, that's how Escobar was dubbed the king of cocaine and to this day is still considered the most wealthy and successful criminal of all time. And so we have a lot of money at stake which is exactly why people kill and are willing to be killed for the cocaine business. So beginning in 1975, Pablo perfected his cocaine production and distribution operation, mainly flying planes out of Colombia and Panama into the United States, where the demand for cocaine was extremely high. In 1976, Escobar married Maria, who he affectionately calls Tata. And then they had two children over the next few years, Juan Pablo, who now goes by Sebastian, the boy, and Manuela, the girl. Now, also in 1976, Escobar and his men were stopped bringing 40 pounds of freebase cocaine back from Ecuador into Medellin. 
Escobar tried to bribe the police officers, but when that didn't work, he then tried to bribe the judges. And when that didn't work, he just had all the witnesses killed. And ultimately, that led to the dismissal of his case, but it really was a precursor for what would transform Colombia into the murder capital of the world in just 15 short years. But let's go back to 1977. As the cartel made more money, they bought bigger planes to smuggle in more cocaine to make more money and to buy even bigger planes, right? Vicious cycle of wealth. The problem was these planes couldn't really make the entire trip without having to stop and refuel, and that was risky. So in 1978, the cartel partners purchased Norman's K. It is an island in the Bahamas, about 200 miles southeast of Florida, and they purchased this as a transshipment point. Now, the island already had an airstrip and plenty of amenities, so Pablo just built a refrigerated warehouse to store the cocaine, and this island served as their staging area for tons and tons and tons of cocaine that was smuggled into the United States between 1978 and 1982. As the empire grew, the Medellin cartel started selling cocaine all over the world. And they transitioned from the coca plants of Colombia to the higher quality coca plants of Bolivia and Peru. So how specifically was Escobar able to smuggle these drugs into the United States? Well, mostly they did it by air. They did some by land and then even some by sea. In the beginning, as I mentioned, he would just fly in smaller planes that were loaded down with cocaine from the Bahamas into Miami. They flew mostly at night, and the more success they had, the bigger the planes became. But once the authorities started catching on to this method, the cartel started doing airdrops out in the ocean and doing boat-to-boat -boat transfers way out at sea to bring the cocaine in by water. They also used some commercial fishing operations where it was normal for them to leave in the morning and be out at sea all day long and then come back in at the end of the day. They were using these commercial fishing operations to smuggle coke into the United States. And they also started doing some land drops. And these were where planes would drop large crates of cocaine into deserted areas of Texas that were picked up by his associates on this side of the border. And interestingly, just prior to the demise of the Medellin cartel, they had actually purchased two remote control Russian submarines that could each hold a ton of cocaine that they were using to get cocaine from Colombia to Mexico, where they were partnering with Mexican cartels to smuggle the cocaine across the border. Now, during their height of power, Roberto Escobar reported in his book that the Medellin cartel was bringing in $420 million a week from cocaine sales. And they claimed to be moving 15 tons of cocaine into the United States every single day. Wow. And it was with these huge profits that Escobar purchased Hacienda Napolis, which is an eight foot square mile estate between Medellin and Bogota, Colombia, upon which he constructed his paradise. Now, when it was completed, it contained a mansion, of course, a lake, a full zoo with antelopes and exotic birds and giraffes and elephants, even hippos. It had a cart racing track. It had its own private airport and helipad. It had large statues of prehistoric animals, giant sculptures. There was a large assortment of old vehicles and luxury vehicles and decommissioned military vehicles. And probably most iconic was an airplane above the entrance to Napolis that was a replica of a Piper PA-18 Super Cab that had crashed and killed a friend of Escobar's in his early days of cocaine distribution. Now that airplane is still there at the entrance to this day, although they have now painted it black and white to kind of look like a zebra. Now this plantation was mainly constructed between 1978 and 1982. And speaking of 1982, in 1982, Escobar was actually elected to the Columbia Chamber of Representatives. Now, he was despised by many of his government colleagues for his known cartel dealings. However, it was through this capacity he was able to build a lot of houses and schools, recreational fields and community centers in areas of poverty that made him a local hero. He often cultivated this Robin Hood-like image by handing out money. 
In return, many of the citizens, including children, would act as informal lookouts for Pablo, hiding information and letting him know about movements by the government and the police in and around Medellin. And it is speculated by many that this short-term stint in government was a desire by Pablo Escobar to effect legislation that would block the extradition of Colombian citizens to the United States. Because remember, drug dealers in the U.S. faced a prison sentence of 10 years to life. And during Pablo's reign as a drug lord, his biggest fear was the prospect of being extradited to the United States where he would undoubtedly serve out multiple life sentences. And that fear became so pronounced that in 1985, Escobar paid the militia group M-19 $1 million to storm the Supreme Court building and seize its files on Los Extraditables, which was regarding a group of cocaine smugglers that the court was contemplating extraditing to the United States. Now, this raid, which has been dubbed the Palace of Justice Siege, turned into an absolute disaster. Now, while the extraditable files were destroyed, 98 people were killed, including over half of the Supreme Court judges during the military's forced retaking of the facility. And years later, Virginia Vallejos, who is a journalist and lover of Escobar, she gave her testimony regarding this incident that would land at least one of the military generals in jail. In response to her testimony, she was granted asylum to the United States, where she presently lives in Miami, Florida. But it was at this point that the government had pretty much lost its patience with Escobar. But, you know, the police were outmanned and they were outgunned. And this battle over extradition really loomed large in Colombian politics over the next several years. In fact, lots of candidates who favored extradition lost their lives. On November 27th of 1989, Pablo Escobar significantly upped the violence when his cartel bombed Avianca Flight 203. All 107 people on board the passenger flight were killed as well as three on the ground that were hit by falling debris. The bombing was an assassination attempt of pro-extradition presidential candidate Cesar Gaviria, who was not on the plane at the time and who actually went on to become the president of Colombia in 1990. Undeterred, nine days later on December 6th of 1989, the cartel bombed the Administrative Department of Security Building, referred to as the DAS Building, in an assassination attempt on its pro-extradition director. The truck bomb destroyed 14 city blocks in Bogota, killed over 60 people, and injured more than 2,000. Again, this assassination attempt missed its mark, as the director escaped unharmed. However, these two incidents are what prompted the Bush administration in the United States to start supporting intelligence activities in Colombia regarding Escobar. So the increase in violence obviously drew the attention of law enforcement, and their incredible grip on the world's cocaine supply caused constant conflict from rival cartels, including the Cali cartel, who was located about 200 miles from Medellin and who had aspirations of taking over the control of the cocaine empire. And so in 1991 and 92, Colombia became the murder capital of the world for both civilian and police deaths, as Escobar was now paying men bounties for the killing of police officers, of which over 600 were killed during this time period. It was during the height of all of this conflict that the Colombian government, wanting to stop all of the violence, actually was able to negotiate Escobar's surrender. And the deal was that in exchange for avoiding extradition to the United States, Escobar would agree to cease all criminal activity and to serve five years in a Colombian prison. But not just any prison, one that Pablo himself would have constructed. So Escobar then built and entered La Catedral, a luxury prison with prison guards of his choosing, and he was in there with other members of his cartel. 
It was basically just a country club. It had a bar, it had a jacuzzi, a giant waterfall. It had an oversized dollhouse for his daughter to play in during visits. And so basically nothing changed for Escobar except for his address. And this continued for about six months until authorities got a belly full of the media reports on Escobar's escapades while he was in prison, right? And on June 22nd of 1992, law enforcement moved in on La Cathedral to take Escobar to a conventional jail. Now, unfortunately for them, he had been tipped off and he successfully evaded recapture. Now, this started the time period where Escobar would ultimately stay on the run for the next 16 months. Following his escape from La Cathedral, the United States Combined Special Forces got involved, and they trained and advised a special task force of Colombian police officers called the Search Block. Their only mission, get Pablo Escobar. In addition, a vigilante group formed called Los Pepes. It was funded by rival drug lords, including the Cali cartel, and wronged associates of Escobar who took a very bloody campaign into the streets of Medellin. In all, over 300 of Escobar's associates were killed, including his lawyer, which I know is incredibly sad. And much of the cartel's properties were destroyed. Now, there is a lot of controversy as to whether members of the official government search bloc were also acting as vigilantes with Los Pepes. But what is clear is that at the very least, the two groups were sharing intel on the whereabouts of Escobar. Now, Pablo was able to stay one step ahead of his pursuers for 16 months until the search block was able to triangulate his position in Medellin using cell phone data. And on December 2nd of 1993, eight men blew the door open to the home where Escobar was staying. They pursued Pablo and his bodyguard, El Limon, up onto the roof as they attempted to flee across adjoining rooftops. Ultimately, El Limon was shot and killed. Escobar suffered gunshot wounds to the leg, torso, and one fatal shot through the ear. There is wide speculation as to whether this final shot was an execution by search block or a died by Escobar himself. He died that day at the age of 44. Now there is an iconic photograph of the men who killed Escobar standing over him. I have chosen not to include it in this video. If you wanna see it, you can Google it. It's easy to find. It's a pretty easy way for me to get demonetized. And also it's hard for me to celebrate the death of any human being, regardless of the things that they have done. So we have left that photo out of this particular summary. Ultimately, having been decimated by Los Pepes and Search Block, the fractured Medellin cartel basically disintegrated in favor of the Cali cartel, who controlled cocaine distribution in Colombia for a spell until they met their end, right? But that's a story for a different day. Now, Escobar is still seen as a saint by some in Medellin, and over 25,000 people attended his funeral. And there are some that even to this day pray specifically to Escobar for divine help. So where are they now? Let's talk about some of the players. So today, Escobar's wife, Maria, she's still alive, and she lives in Buenos Aires, Argentina, with her two children. Now, her son, who goes by Sebastian, he published a book called Pablo Escobar, My Father, giving his accounts of Pablo's escapades. Now, Sebastian really, really, really didn't like Netflix's Narcos, calling it false and disgusting and untrue. But even the producers of Narcos said, eh, it's about 50% true and about 50% we just totally made up. So it's not meant to be an exact accounting of the story of Pablo Escobar. Virginia Vallejo, easy for me to say, right? Who was the journalist and lover of Pablo Escobar. She published her memoirs, Loving Pablo, Hating Escobar in 2007, detailing her romantic entanglements with Escobar, and it also inspired the movie Loving Pablo in 2017. And recall that her testimony regarding the palace siege sent a military leader to prison. Brother Roberto Escobar, 
He's still alive, and he is quite the firecracker. In addition to the book that he wrote, he has publicly threatened to sue Elon Musk, Apple, and Netflix over their dramatization of the family in Narcos. Ultimately, after Escobar was killed in 1993, the Colombian government took over Hacienda Napolis. Most of the animals were transferred to other zoos, other than the hippopotamuses, which escaped, and they started living in the nearby lakes and streams. Now, today... They have multiplied from the four hippos that were there at the time to 40. And there is great disagreement in the community as to whether they should be relocated or just let be. Now, note, hippopotamuses are known to be aggressive jackasses, right? And they are not native to Colombia. So it's understandable why some of the locals would want them out of there. Today, in 2021, the plantation is an amusement park. It contains an animal safari-like zoo as well as a water park. It's called Parque Temetico Hacienda Napolis, and it's surrounded by four luxury hotels. And last but not least, when we're talking about where are they now, let's talk about cocaine. And cocaine today. So ultimately, the popularity of cocaine has declined from the 70s and the 80s. It's still called the rich man's drug, but it has been largely replaced by meth and heroin and fentanyl, which has a lot more potency for a lot less cost. However, there is still a demand for cocaine, and in particular, the cheaper version crack cocaine. And although Escobar is gone and the Medellin cartel has been gobbled up by other cartels, South America is still where most of the world's cocaine is originated. However, modern-day Colombian cartels have partnered with Mexican cartels, and most notably the Sinaloa cartel, formerly headed by El Chapo, who you may have heard of. So by partnering with Mexican cartels, they can bring the cocaine right up next to the United States border in cartel staging areas, and they mostly break it down into smaller quantities, and it's carried across the border by mules. They do this by either car or on their person or in their person, if you know what I mean. Now, they still do airdrops in California and Arizona and Texas, but as law enforcement has expanded their efforts, uh, cartels have gotten more and more creative, and they package the cocaine in smaller quantities. It's easier to conceal on the mules, and if they get caught, you lose less product. So that is the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. As I mentioned, Pablo Escobar's life has been memorialized in countless books and movies and shows, including Blow, American Made, and most recently in the Netflix drama Narcos. Check out those for more narco entertainment. And remember, they are entertainment. Even the producers of Narcos, like I said, said half of what they put in there, they just simply made up. So that's the history of Pablo Escobar. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, smash that like button for me. If you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe. And as you guys know, I love it when you share me on social media. Again, my name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. 